Naomi Natali is a TED Fellow. She is an installation artist, a photographer, and social activist who uses art to bring about and inspire social change. She accomplishes this by creating large-scale art installations that engage hundreds and thousands of artists, activists, and children to act on behalf of a social cause. Please welcome Naomi. <laughs> I've spent the past couple years trying to find ways in which to use the power of art to inspire action and create positive social change. I started on this path with a project I founded in 2006 called The Cradle Project. And The Cradle Project was a fundraising art installation designed to call attention to the 48 million children orphaned by disease and poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa. The mission was to increase awareness of this crisis while raising the funds that are needed that, to help um, feed, shelter, and educate these children. My vision was to use the symbolism of empty cradles and falling sand to represent the lost potential of these ch children. And my idea was to gather hundreds of empty cradles made by artists from around the world out of scrap and discarded materials and display them in a single space against a backdrop of slowly falling sand, believing that hundreds of empty cradles would speak volumes about loss. There was also an educational component to the project where we asked educators to bring the project into their classrooms as a way to educate their students about orphan and vulnerable children and teaching our future leaders to be compassionate, concerned, and informed citizens is how I believe we truly change the world. So this aspect of the project was exceptionally important. To raise funds, we asked that each of the cradles submitted be sponsored for $100, and then at the end of the installation, we asked that the, the cradles were auctioned off in an online auction, raising further funds. And the money that was raised from the sponsorship and sale of cradles was donated to our partner organization, the Firelight Foundation who awards grants to grassroots initiatives that are directly addressing the needs of children affected by HIV and AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. This was an incredibly personal project for me. In 2002, I was given an opportunity to travel to Kenya um, and work with a nonprofit organization there, photo documenting the orphan crisis for their fundraising efforts. And the experience dramatically changed my life. I left for Kenya with statistics and information in my head, and I came back with faces and real life stories. I'll never forget a story I was told while in Kibera, which is the largest slum in Kenya, of two orphan brothers who were from there. The younger of the brothers was eight years old at the time, and he carried this small piece of clay in his pocket that for one shilling he would sculpt into whatever you asked, only to smash it down again for the next person willing to pay. His older brother, who was 11 years old at the time, they said could make small airplanes out of scrap metal that would actually fly. And the reason the story was being told to me was because the two brothers had gone missing and were feared dead. Given their amazing talents, I could only imagine what they would have accomplished in better circumstances. And to this day, I continuously wonder about the tremendous potential that's disappearing along with the lives and futures of children like these. During my time in Kenya, there were more than a million children orphaned in the country. Currently, just six years later, that number has more than doubled. With nearly 50 million children orphaned in sub-Saharan Africa alone, how do we begin to wrap our heads around that potential loss of hopes and dreams and imagination? And that was really the point of the project, to create a space that would begin that conversation, even if within ourselves. To any parent or caregiver, the significance of a cradle empty before its time is powerful and obvious. But one cradle would never say enough. And so I imagine the space with hundreds of empty cradles made out of scrap and discarded materials to say that if we could see enough potential in pieces of scrap to make structures meant to cradle a child, then surely every one of us would be challenged to see and help realize the potential of our world's orphan children. The Cradle Project opened in June of 2008 with over 550 cradles submitted by artists from all over. There was a publication donated to, the, to accompany the exhibit, which is still available and raising funds for the firelight. 
I put this project out there not knowing a thing about organizing an event, and nor did I know but a couple people in Albuquerque where I'd recently moved. But the response was really remarkable. And I learned so much about people and their hearts and their willingness to give of themselves if they're given an outlet and asked to do so. From the beginning, I was so fortunate to have drawn this core group of volunteers who for two years worked tirelessly to see this project through. And it was really interesting because those of us working on the project from the beginning had imagined that the greatest impacts the project would have would be on the money we raised or this impact of viewing all these cradles in one space. But what we didn't expect was the impact that the project would have on the individual artists who participated. And let me, ask that we, let me just mention that we've really asked a lot of these artists because we asked them to create and donate a work, we asked them to find a $100 sponsorship, and then we also asked them to ship it to us. <laughs> and I had people telling me I was insane, I was nobody, the project had no history. But the artists came, and they brought with them their hearts. For the over 550 cradles that were submitted, there was a story behind every one of them. And I consider myself so privileged to really know a lot of them. Kathy Hughes and Karen Abood were two artists from New Orleans who had heard about the project from an article written in School Arts Magazine. As educators, they thought they would bring the project into their class and have their students create cradles, but they also wanted to submit a piece on their own, and they the two collaborated on this piece. In their artist statement, they explained how they used the experience of creating their cradle to process their emotions regarding Hurricane Katrina. Their cradle, which was constructed out of discarded refuge from Katrina flooded houses, they perfectly titled Katrina Cradled. Vincent Leandrew was an artist from Oregon who happened to be traveling in New Mexico at the time that we first launched the project. And he picked up one of our postcards, and as soon as he got back to Oregon, he emailed me, told me he was going to be submitting a piece. And this is the first piece he made out of a discarded table and the backs of two chairs titled Broken Home. He went on to make more cradles. And then in the fall of 2007, we had organized a number of preview exhibitions in both Santa Fe and Albuquerque as a way to showcase some cradles, get some more attention and support for the project. And he had heard about them and offered to drive them down. And these are some of them. And you can see how much time and intention he had put into them. He went back to Oregon and he wasn't done. In all, he made nine beautifully handcrafted cradles, which he hand-delivered to Albuquerque. And the second time he came down, we were installing the show, going insane. We all had real jobs we were trying to juggle while doing it. But I wanted to thank him for all he had done, and so I got to take him to breakfast before he had to head back. And I think he could tell I was losing it, because he asked me how I was holding up. And I went on a long rant about how tired I was. And when I finally shut up enough to ask him how he was doing, I'll never forget what he said. He said, well, Naomi, I don't know what I would have done without the Cradle Project this year. He had recently lost his aunt, who was like a mother to him. And in her name, the last cradle he made was out of her blanket and her walker, titled Ruthie's Cradle. And then there were the children and their stories. You know, of the over dozens of student participated, participants who submitted artist statements with their work, there was one that really stood out to me. His name is Henry Kynwith. He's a fifth grader at Monte Vista Elementary School. And his teacher, Andrea Letter, had used the platform of the Cradle Project to teach her students about orphan and vulnerable children for three months using a variety of very creative activities. And in his artist statement, he said, I painted my cradle red and blue to signify the two most wasted liquids in the world, blood and water. All of these participants, both young and old, opened themselves up to the greater human population to imagine a world filled with opportunity for all, and to transform hope into community awareness and action. I learned so much working on this project. And what I learned is why I'm standing here today with more passion than I have ever had to put out a new project. I learned the importance of creating a visual movement based on civic engagement and participation. At this moment, I believe that the tangible is crucial that people need to understand their role in a movement if they're going to consider participating. They need to be able to see that they can take ownership in that movement and have their action followed by a reaction. Letters and phone calls and emails to decision makers play an extremely important role. But not enough people do them because they doubt their individual correspondence make a difference, which leads to inaction, nothing changes, and people give up hope. 
and it's these thoughts that have inspired my new project. Now, I want to pile one million fabricated bones made by artists, activists, and school students on the National Mall in DC. This project is called One Million Bones, and it is my personal response to genocides that are happening today. One Million Bones is a fundraising art installation recognizing the millions of victims who have been killed or displaced by ongoing genocides. The mission is to increase awareness of these atrocities while raising the funds that are needed to protect and aid displaced and vulnerable victims. The idea is to get one million people to each create one bone representing one victim. Installed together, these million bones will flood the National Mall in DC like a mass grave, unearthing the memory of the millions of genocide victims who have suffered under our watch. Each bone will be sponsored for $5, generating $5 million to be donated to our partner organizations working to protect and aid displaced and vulnerable victims. For those participants who want to get involved but don't see how they'll make a bone, a $15 contribution will enable a bone to be manufactured and sponsored for them. And these manufactured bones will be made of biodegradable materials impregnated with seeds so that at the end of the installation, these bones can be distributed to be buried with the foreseeable future of growth. As a visual artist, I tend to understand things better in a visual context. And so the idea of recreating a mass grave struck me as a way to express the gravity of this issue to a multitude of people. I knew that viewing a mass grave would have a profound impact on me, that my grief would move me to take action. But most of us will never view a mass grave. And most of us will never understand what a pile of human bones looks or sounds or feels like. And even though that installation would not be an actual grave, it would represent those graves that are being filled today on our watch, even now as we're sitting here. In 1994, during the Rwandan genocide, National Security Advisor Anthony Lake stated that if the United States government was to support effective action to stop the genocide, then the American public must make it clear that's what they want. He encouraged human rights advocates to make more noise and thereby direct the U.S. government's response to the crisis. Well, I want us to make noise today in Sudan, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Burma, in places around the world. People are being denied their right to exist. Governments are murdering their people. And our governments are responsible by international law to intervene. But we as their citizens must tangibly pressure them to do so. By installing one million bones on the National Mall in DC, I am demanding that the people and the journalists and the politicians that they pay attention. And I do believe that one million people standing and acting and speaking in one place at one time against one issue will create a noise impossible to ignore. And I know this idea is wild. <laughs> I'm this little crazy woman with this big crazy bone idea. <laughs> but I believe in it. And I believe in the power of finding our voices. But in order for that to happen, I need your support. And I'm asking all of you to get involved. I've spent the past year planning and researching the feasibility of this project, and the logistics are overwhelming. <laughs> and I kind of got in this mindset thinking, I need a million bones. I don't care what they look like. And then even before I officially launched the project, I got my first bone in the mail by an artist, Kathy Barrow, who happened to hear about it through a friend of hers. And as you can see, it's not one bone, but it's 27 bones. And it makes up an entire hand. And when I received it from its package, I stood still to place my hand on this one. Because this artist spent hours, if not days, working on this piece, thinking about this issue. And it makes me wonder that if we could possibly channel this intention into one cause, could it possibly be enough to create the noise that can bring the change? It was pointed out to me earlier this year that in my work, I was going from the cradle to the grave. And that may seem very obvious to you, but I had never, it had never dawned on me. And I thought about what that meant, the cradle, you know, the symbol of human potential. 
and the grave, which in this life could be considered its opposite. But I had never thought about that way. Because for me, both of these projects were made to tell the same story, the story of human potential, which is ultimately a story of hope. Because with action, these graves could be transformed into cradles, which is the idea that a bone would be buried and a flower or a garden could grow. I had the extraordinary honor of meeting Zoya Pan this year at TED Global. She's also a TED Global Fellow. And she's a Burmese human rights activist who at the age of 14 had to flee her home with her family after their village was destroyed. Her father, who was a freedom activist, was assassinated after numerous attempts were made on his life. And she herself has survived three assassination attempts at the age of 28. She's now become one of the most significant voices for the caring people of Burma. She is their face of hope. And despite the danger, she's not going to stop talking, and she's not going to stop telling her story until the world finally gets it. That genocide is happening. That her people and her culture are being systematically eliminated by a brutal regime that's been in power for decades, while the world has turned its head. In my heart, Zoya is the flower that grows after these bones have been buried. She represents the hope and the potential that humanity should be fighting for. At some point, if we decide to look back, we are going to have to acknowledge that the history we lived and were a part of allowed genocide. That never again became again and again on our watch. And all I know is that I'm not OK with that, because there are solutions to stopping and preventing genocide. And as a part of humanity and for the sake of humanity, as individuals, we can use our voices and our actions to tell our government and the international community that we want those solutions to also be a part of this history of ours. In closing, I just want to point out the whistle that I'm wearing, because it's a falling whistle. And it's a symbol of a story of children who are abducted in Congo and sent to the front lines of a war armed with only a whistle as a diversion tactic. So that when they blow these whistles, the first bullets fired claim these children. I just want to point out the power of a symbol to tell a story and the importance for those who know the story to keep telling it. Thank you so much. <laughs>